I'm Michelle Mitchell and welcome to Planet Wine. This is not your ordinary wine show. We'll be getting down to the nitty gritty with the winemakers and those in the know, but not before we jump in and experience just why we enjoy wine in the first place. We're kicking off with champagne and sparkling wine, not just because it's our first episode, but because champagne is the king of wine. And it doesn't always get the respect it deserves out there in the wine world. We're gonna set the record straight. Now, these are my friends. Some are true wine gurus, some are not. They're all coming to my annual champagne brunch party. And I'm on this quest to prove that champagne is not just for celebrations or to be had with caviar. This is an everyday drink. This year, I brought in a reinforcement, a professional chef, Kathy Reese. She is making an amazing menu for my friends whose only requirements are to show up and bring a bottle of champagne. You have no idea how dicey this proposition is because we have no idea what's gonna walk through that door. I can't stand it. I have to try something. I'm so oh, Michelle, hungry. Oh, Michelle, you should. You should. <laughs> what is that? This is kind of like a bread pudding, kind of like a French toast, but it's using a cheese called Chaors, which is from the Champagne region. Mmm. Like Parfait. It? Oh, mm. good. But the idea here is to have the cheese from the Champagne region play up that terroir flavor in the champagne. So it's obviously the cows are eating the grass from that region. The grass is growing in the same kind of environment as the grapes are growing in. It should lend a certain mystique, a certain complement to the wine in a certain way that other cheeses maybe wouldn't. And I've partnered it with a raisin pecan bread. And that gives you like a little bit like a cheese course in France where you would have a bread like this. But it's also a little bit almost like dessert because it's a little bit uh, French toasty bread pudding. -y, I was just going to say, it. it's so rich, it's so good. Hey, Alan. Hey, how's it Meet going? Alan Dorensko. Hey, the man knows the region of Burgundy oh better God, than really I know like shoes, and that's no small shoes. order. The people who know me know I'm fanatical about a couple things NASCAR, the Pittsburgh Steelers, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, when it comes to wine, I'm fanatical about the wines of Burgundy. Now, just like where I'm from, it's Pittsburgh Steelers country. Burgundy is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay country. Now, although there are a couple other grapes in Burgundy, we're talking about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It's the same with Champagne. There's a few other grapes in Champagne, but overwhelmingly, the great wines of Champagne are Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Good? Cool in the game? Anyone who sends me Champagne scores major points. This one comes all the way from California, from Rick and Justin. Rick and Justin are my right hands on the left coast. By day, they run a hip wine store out in Napa Valley called Grosinger's. By night, well, let's just say that the world of wine will never be a safe place again. Yes. Yeah, no problem. It, no, it's not that good. Um, when they're not trying to find undiscovered you know, gems for their clients and filling orders, the boys manage to find ways to keep themselves busy. We're here at Schramsberg Vineyards, just south of Calistoga. Uh, Schramsberg is the oldest producer of champagne method sparkling wines in the United States. We're going to head into the caves, talk to Schramsberg president and winemaker Hugh Davies. We're going to talk about frogs and we're going to talk about bubbles. Well, it looks an awful lot like Raiders of the Lost Ark in here, but we're actually at Schramsberg. This, this facility here was founded originally back in 1862. Uh, and then after prohibition, it remained dormant for about 50 years. And then in the mid-60s, my parents arrived here uh, with, the, with the sole purpose of making California's first bottle fermented sparkling wine using Chardonnay and Pinot Noir uh, and the traditional champagne method. We're in the process of bottling, uh, so this is an exciting time of year. We have, we have the harvest season, which is typically August, September, October, uh, but then there's the bottling season, so April, May, and June. Do you uh, think credibility to the rumors that the French set up California sparkling houses to produce inferior champagne compared to the 
mother projects it in France. Well, that's a that's a pretty aggressive uh, aggressive statement there. I I uh, I don't know. You you sometimes wonder. How do you see the future of uh, California's sparkling wine market? I think it's pretty bright. Here in California, we're blessed to have a bit more sun than they do in, in, in the wine growing regions of France, um, a little less moisture uh, and during the growing season. And so we are able to capture uh, with those cool ocean breezes coming over, over, over the, the, the land close to the bay and close to the ocean, we're able to capture the, the intense levels of acidity that you'll find in Champagne, but with more intense fruitful character. What is up with the frog? Well, the Riddler's night out is is uh, become a bit of a mascot for the winery. On his night out, the Riddler then joins the uh, the, the pogs in the frond outside, and uh, he dons his, his tuxedo, and he's got a bottle of uh, J. Shram actually. And it's said that on a full moon night, uh, he's checking the, the glass for clarity. How do they get the bubbles in Champagne? It's it, the secondary fermentation of the wine. A lot of violent kind of chemical reactions happen and everything and it produces carbon dioxide. So the bubbles explode out of the bottle when you open it up and it's, that's where the bubbles come from basically, you know. Interesting, cheers. Absolutely.